We read from the Word of God as we find it in the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both had access by one spirit unto, one, unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles the prophet and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. May God bless and apply the reading of his word. In verses 8 through 10, 8 through 10 of Ephesians 2, we read, By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In Lord's Day 23, we saw the declaration of God that we are righteous. That knowledge and assurance of our righteousness is ours through faith, through faith in the truth of the Word of God. But we may know that though our conscience accuse us, 
we are righteous in God's sight so that he looks at us, to use the words of article of question and answer 60, as if we had fully accomplished all the obedience that Christ hath accomplished for me. So it's not by works. It's by grace alone. Without works. Lord's Day 24. But why cannot our good works be the whole or even a part of our righteousness before God? Because that the righteousness that which can be approved of before the tribunal of God must be absolutely perfect and in all respects conformable to the divine law. That first. And then second, and also that our best works in this life are all imperfect and defiled with sin. What? Do not our good works merit, which yet God will reward in this and in a future life? This reward is not of merit, but of grace. But doth not this doctrine make men careless and profane? By no means. For it is impossible for those who are implanted into Christ by a true faith that they should not bring forth fruits of thankfulness. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace alone. And yet, we are saved in order to do good works. The good works don't come before salvation. They come after, and they flow out of. Look at, look at this passage, verse 8, Ephesians 2. By grace ye are saved. Verse 9, not of works. And yet 10 says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So again, we're not saved because of good works. We are saved unto good works. That's about which this Lord's Day deals. And we consider that we are justified graciously unto good works. We first consider what's the value of our good works. Even the ones we're created unto, what's the value of them? And so our first point is Damnable unworthiness. Damnable unworthiness. Now, the inclination is, well, if I can't do anything good, I'm not going to do anything at all. So we consider, but wait a minute. We may not live any way we want, what they call carelessly and profanely. No. There is a spiritual necessity to do good works. Even though they are damnable and unworthy, there is a necessity for us to do them. And God, knowing us as his children as well as what he does, lets us know that there is a real reward. A real reward. That he promises us. That's related to the good works we do. In thankfulness. So, we're graciously justified unto good works. And even as we do them, we recognize their damnable unworthiness. But their spiritual necessity 
and their real re reward. Not only is it true in the history of the church that there's two ditches about good works. One is you got to do them in order to be saved, and the other is that of antinomianism, which teaches, man, our good works are totally unnecessary, and they're almost an evil to do. So you got two ditches. Not only are those two ditches in the history of the Reformed faith, but the devil knows how to work on us. And given the presence of our old man, we're often inclined to slide off center. Sometimes we want to avoid a ditch, and we're so working hard, we're working so hard to avoid a ditch that we go into the other ditch. Well, we've got to realize that in this case, we don't want to be with the Pelagians and the Arminians and the Federal Visionists and the Roman, Roman Catholic Church that says our good works may not play much of a role, but they're so important and so necessary that they play a role in our salvation. That's one ditch. But we don't want to then jump into the other ditch either. Go all the way across the road and get into the conclusion, well, it doesn't make any difference. Our good works are nothing at all anyway. So we want to walk in the middle. How do we do that? Well, first, we look at how do we avoid these ditches? To avoid the ditch that good works, well, let's do it this way. This is how we most commonly say it. You know that, that neighbor pretty good guy. He's a pretty good guy. He doesn't go to church. Doesn't curse. Don't swear. Good businessman. He's honest in his business and dealings. Pretty good Joe. Very closely related to that is that when somebody starts criticizing us, we're very quick to want to remind them about, but I did it this time. Maybe I, I didn't do it that time. But I did it right this time, and I did it right that time. Sure, I, it's like this. I hit the rumble strip once, so I was on that thing for just a few feet. And you forget about all the time and all the miles that went by, and I didn't hit it. We always are inclined to want to present our good works. How do we answer that? How do we deal with that ditch? How do we honestly and biblically respond to that way of thinking? Catechism helps us. First, maybe we can say, that the things that we do receive the approval of other humans. But we're not talking about whether we're receiving the approval of other humans. When we talk about a good work, we're talking about receiving the approval of God. Oh, that's very, very different. Our standard of good is over here. God's standard of good is absolutely perfect. It's got to be absolutely perfect for God to say that it's good. So the only righteousness that could set us before God has to receive His approval to such an extent that He would say about us, there is absolutely no fault and no weakness and no error in it whatsoever. Now praise the Lord. The work of our Lord Jesus Christ from the beginning of his life, of his incarnation to the end of his life, was absolutely perfect. In fact, 
when we talk about do our good works give us some approval from God, the answer to that is, wait a minute, the perfect righteousness that is ours in Jesus Christ is so absolutely perfect you can't add to it. And even more, you don't need to add to it. Jesus did it all. His sacrificial gift, the merit of His life, and the power of His death and resurrection is so great that we can't add because it's perfect. It's perfect. He saves to the uttermost. So, we're really dealing with a question we don't even have to deal with. Why do you want to add to what Jesus did when what Jesus did was perfect? That first. But secondly, we have to look at what we call good by others or by ourselves We've got to bring them close. We've got to get them right under the light of the law of God. It, and it's not whether we can see it all because we're going to see the surface. But we know that the eyes of Jehovah go right down inside. And He sees the motive. He sees the reason for why we do it. And he sees every part when we're vacillating, doing it right, and then we got the wrong motive, then we got the right one. God sees it all. He sees it all. And then he makes three thoughts that we want. Three, he presents three thoughts in the scriptures about our good works. The first one, rather familiar, is Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah 64, verse 6. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses, sounds pretty good so far, are as filthy rags. We are so busy comparing our filthy rags with other people's filthy rags that we say, mine is better than yours. But from God's perspective, they're all worthy only of the dump, of the fire. They're not worthy of anything but to be thrown away. The canons in that fifth head even as they're identifying what a saint is, say about uh, the saint this, he is somebody whom God calls according to his purpose into communion with his son. It is somebody whom God regenerates by the Holy Spirit and he delivers them from the dominion and slavery of sin in this life. So that is, they don't have to sin. They're delivered from the slavery and dominion of sin, yet not altogether. They are not altogether delivered from the body of sin, nor are they altogether delivered from the infirmities of the flesh, so long as they continue in the world. Hence, daily sins of weakness and spots adhere to the best works of the saints. The best is in God's judgment in need of washing. You have an idea about God. You have an idea about Scripture. Total depravity hasn't left us yet. 
Maybe it's, maybe it's correct to say that the child of God, because he has a regenerated heart, he's got something in him that's born again, he's not totally depraved. But if we have a regenerated heart, the right description of every part of our soul and every part of our body, all these lusts of the flesh that we read of here in the first part of Ephesians 2 is so dirty and so filthy that we never do anything perfectly. You did this. Yeah, but what about... No. Everything we do is dirty and needs the blood of Jesus. Number two, Jesus put it this way in Matthew 7. Everyone who goes into heaven with this thought in mind, Lord, we've we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have we not cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. I went to church twice. I didn't get drunk Friday night. I knew my catechism. I'm Protestant Reformed. Jesus says to those who want to present their good works to him this way. I never knew you. I never knew you. I know who you are, but you're not one of mine. Not when you think that way. Salvation is by grace. And now nobody knows that better than us. And yet, how often don't we still want to present our good works? Our works do nothing to earn, and they do nothing to lose. The good that we do does not add to, and the bad that we do does not detract from what Jesus did. First thought is, our best works, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Second thought is, that if we want to present to Jesus something that we did, then don't ever, listen, don't ever forget to hear him say, this is what he says, I never knew you, and shiver. Shiver so hard that you run from ever even thinking. This is pretty good. Third. In the parable that Jesus told in Luke 17, very familiar parable, we learn that Adam, before the fall, when he did Everything as God required it of him was in his relationship to God identified by Jesus this way, Luke 17.10, an unprofitable servant. Even Adam before the fall didn't profit God, didn't enrich God, didn't make God a little bit better. So even if we don't sin, and even if we did everything perfect, we are unprofitable servants. That's the attitude, the right, humble attitude of a child of God. So, first, damnable unworthiness. That's what our best works are going to be. 
Well, then we hear those who come against the Reformed faith and say, well, then you're going to have your people live carelessly. Then it doesn't make any difference how they live. Then, hey, how about this? Why don't you even sin so that grace may abound? Doesn't make any difference how we live. Oh. And here's, here's a beautiful thought that the scriptures give. We're going to look at four reasons that the child of God who is saved by grace cannot be and will not be careless. First, to have God as God, to be a religious being, to have God as God is to assume a position of service. To live any way I want? No, no, I'm a religious being. God is God. I am here to serve my God, to serve him because of who he is, to serve him because of what he is that is so worthy of my service. To live the way I want and do whatever I please is so contrary to remembering I'm in the service of a God. Now, I know how easy it is for every single one of us at different times of our busy life and activity, and especially when we're having fun. I can see it happening over and over again at, at, at a convention week. You, you're busy, you're having fun, and you forget. I'm in the service of my God, of the God of heaven and earth. I'm in his service. See, so then it's not, what can he give me? What can I get out of it? No, it's what more can I give? What more can I give? That's the attitude of worship, of service. That first. Second. To be careless and profane is a spiritual impossibility for someone who has been joined in the bond of faith to Jesus. Sometimes we say, he's shepherd, we're sheep. Sometimes they say, he's master and we're disciples. He's the trunk and we're the branches. We're connected to him. We're not goats. We're not dead branches. No, we're, we're, we're engrafted into Jesus. We've got something going on inside. We're alive. We're united to Jesus, the Savior. And the very nature of this connection that, that we have with him is that his life is going into us. His values are going into us. His mind is going into us. We begin to think the way He thinks. We begin to love what He loves and to hate what He hates. That connection makes us, to use the language of Lord's Day 1, willing to yield ourselves unto Him and all of our members into his service. So one, 
as religious beings, we're in the service of a God. Two, faith unites us to the Lord Jesus, the Savior who now is my Lord. Third, it is impossible to be careless when you realize that you are justified. And as one justified, you're now dead to sin. Here in Ephesians 5, Ephesians 2, you were dead in sin, now you're dead to sin. That's the language of Romans 6 as well. You were dead in it. Now you've been made alive spiritually. So now you're dead to sin. Now being dead to sin does not mean, well, now I don't sin anymore. No, being dead to sin gives to you freedom from the dominion and slavery of sin. Those are the key words. And what does that mean, to be delivered from the dominion and slavery of sin? I'll put it as simply as possible, and you've heard me say this before. To be delivered from the dominion and slavery of sin means that you can say meaningfully, I'm sorry, please forgive me. To be in the dominion and slavery of sin is you keep making excuses. You keep denying. But to be delivered from the dominion and slavery of sin, to be justified, to be dead to sin, means I can say no to me. That's right. Yeah, you thought I was going to say no to sin. That's true. To me, sin. Err. I can say no to this sinner and humbly admit that's to be dead to sin. That's to be freed from the dominion and slavery of sin. Four. We don't become careless and, careless and profane when we grow to appreciate His love. And the more you appreciate His love, the more you're going to realize that's not just love, that's undeserved love. It's grace. Undeserved love. Because the more he loves me, the more I see how unworthy, how I don't deserve it. And then that love becomes amazing. Unbelievable amazing. And it captures. And that's the last one you want to displease. That's the first one you want to please. You want to thank for, for still loving even me. It means, to use the words of the catechism again, I'm sorry, the canons, to be humbled, to adore the depths of God's mercy, to be fervent in the desire to render unto him grateful returns of ardent love to him who first manifested so great a love towards me. And when does he not stop I'm sorry, when is he not manifesting so great a love toward us? He just keeps doing it. Can't be careless and profane. No. 
then we realize that the nature of the grace of God in this gracious salvation is that he saves us unto good works. Think about that a minute. Five quick thoughts. One, God commands us to do good. We delight to obey him out of love. He commands us. Two, the nature of God's work of what we found in Lord's Day 23, he justified us. He made a declaration whereby he imparts and imputes to us the perfect righteousness, satisfaction, and holiness of Jesus Christ. When God does that to one, he makes them willing in the day of his power to praise and honor and thank him. Ye sons of the mighty, all glory and honor be given to him. Third, the knowledge of that justification, the knowledge of that salvation, so gracious, arising only out of the power of God's love, is what makes us sensitive to what it is to sin against God's love, to sin against grace. It's one thing to sin against somebody who hates you. It's a totally different thing to sin against somebody who loves you. That's what this salvation does. Fourth, when God gives us the grace of justification, that's the beginning of a work that he complains, completes all the way to the end when Jesus comes again. So when he gives justification, he also gives sanctification. He begins that work of making us holy to live henceforth unto him, ready and willing henceforth to live unto him. And then finally, one who experiences saving grace desires to bring forth fruits of thankfulness. I don't want to do just what I have to do. I want to do my best. I don't want to just sing with everybody in church. I just don't want to open my mouth and make sure that mom and dad will see that I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to open my mouth as wide as I can and I'm going to give God my best. I'm not just going to warm a seat. I'm going to honor him. I'm not just going to be in church. I'm going to adore him. I'm not just going to go to work on Monday. I'm going to live aware that he sees me, and I'm going to do it in his service diligently, my best. That's what it means to be loved so much by God himself. Now God says, you're just like little children. I love you, but I know you. And I'm not going to stand behind you with a whip. You better. And I'm not going to stand behind you with a threat of a strap that if you don't, I'm going to get you. God says, this is how I work with my children. It's all grace. It's all grace. To be saved. And even the reward is one of grace. But I'm going to promise you to encourage you. To give you stimulation to do it. I'm going to set before you a promise of a, re of a reward. I want to encourage you. 
So over and over and over in the scriptures, there speaks of a promise. You give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, you shall not lose your reward. Mark 10, verse 42. Every man is rewarded according to his works. Matthew 16, 27, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, and Hebrews 6, verse 10, and Revelation 22, verse 12. The reward is held out especially to those who suffer for Jesus' sake. Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12 and 19, verse 29. The Bible speaks about a reward. But, and that concept of reward does not ever conflict with the knowledge that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. But it merely is letting us know that God is a Father and being perfectly just, he, he gives grace. He rewards his works. See, Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship to unto good works which God before ordained that we should walk in them. He planned them. He planned them all. We walk through them. We do them. And then we look back. And we have to say, he gave me the grace to do it. He gave me the grace of the desire to do it. It's all of him. And while God says, yep, it's all of me. Nevertheless, I did it through you. And I promise to reward you according to your works. I want to encourage you. Every, all the past is done. What about tonight? Some of you are going to go to a inspiration. Some of you are going to go home. Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it out of thanks. Strive to focus on thanking Him. And knowing that He sees and he promises to reward you. That's the nature of love. You see, we're not servants. We're not slaves. We're children of a heavenly father. We have the best position in all the world. Because we've got God as our Father. Amen. We thank and praise Thee. Thou who dost come near to speak, to encourage, to help. We honor Thee, O Lord our God, the giver of good grace powerful grace and we admire that grace for Jesus sake Amen